So, what are we talking in terms of leadership? Many different ways. John Cotter is a very well established commentator and he emphasizes, as do many people, that distinction between leadership and management. Leadership is about change, management is about consistency. Management's more about. Now, that, whether that's a fair distinction, but you know, if you look at the great bulk of the literature on leadership, that shines through. It's a lot about transformation, it's about change, it's about facilitating that change. If you go into Amazon, there are about 11,500 books on leadership. You know, take your pick, but most of them will focus on change. Um, you know, Bert Nanus, who's one of the sort of well-established commentators, again, you know, nice quote he uses, you know, dream the gene, but put it into practice, you know, the reality issue. Um, you know, how do you engage other people so they don't feel they're being imposed on? And, you know, Tao Chong, it's a very old sort of Chinese way of thinking about, you know, we did it ourselves. How do we mobilize people so they do things willingly? Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of issues about lions and goats and team players and captains in teams and all the rest of it. But there are many, many different definitions within those 11,500 books. Um, if anyone wants these slides, rather than trying to desperately write this down, I'm sure they'll be available from, from Ruth, rather than trying to capture this all down within there. And I think one of the things for me is just looking at the images of leadership. I mean, for me, I think this is a fascinating You've got that politician, you've got the guy who's been in prison for 25 years, you've got this you know, extraordinary image of putting on that apartheid, that, that African symbol of power, that green, um, what do you call it, it's a shirt, it's that green rugby shirt, talking with Francois Pina you know, in 1984. And, and you, know, Pina, you know, classic, the heartland African, the oak, the tough man, the rugged man, and these two people, two reflections of leadership, Really interesting. Um, you know, what did they have in common? They're both wearing the same shirt. Well, I suspect Pino was a lot fitter than my brother. But that's understandable. He spent 25 years in prison. You know, etc., etc. But it's worth thinking about these sorts of images when we think leadership. You know, what is it that you know that comes out and needs to shine through? What have they got in common? Is it the fact they just had a goal? They had an inspiration. And was it actually that, you know, Mandela was prepared to eat humble pie? He was prepared to put on that green shirt. This was about reconciliation. This was about building a new South Africa. You know, Pino talks about, in fact, Pino talks about, you know, how shocking and how surprised he was to see Mandela coming up wearing the shirt. It was the shirt that did it. Um, and anyone who saw that movie in Victor's, you know, what, what that sort of, is, is, you know, sort of tries to capture that. The book is much better. The book on which the film is based really captures the leadership issues that were going on at the time, these two different leadership images. Um, you know, but you compare that with these two very equally stubborn, equally difficult. Anyone who worked with Churchill, anyone who worked with Gandhi, you know, they have the same thing. By God, they had a goal. They were going to go there. I mean, Churchill, who'd been out in the wilderness through the 30s, Gandhi, who'd been in prison, salt marches, whatever. Um, but I think it's just interesting when, again, you think of these sort of political leaders, what is it that they have in common? It's something to do with a goal, it's something to do with persistence, um, and in a sense, not saying no. It would have been very easy for Churchill to have just sort of given way in 1940, and the same for Gandhi to have made some sort of deal, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, again, when you're thinking leadership, it's always worth thinking about these sorts of images from the private sector, you know, again, very different sorts. You've got Branson, the entrepreneur, the hustler. Some people might say he should be in prison. You know, there are all sorts of debates about his history. And you've got Jack Welsh, very much the corporate man, the sort of shark guy who'd written lots of books about leadership. Welsh was interesting because he said how boring it was being a leader. It's like stunningly boring. Because at the end of the day, one of the things you have to do is stay on message. So whatever that mantra for that six months, every time you met anybody in Star, you had to say on this, you said it was absolutely central to being a leader, was the consistency of the message um, if you're in a big corporation. And, and in that sense, he's quite insightful. Uh, I'm not sure Branson would have that same level of insight, but he ran a fairground. You know, that had to skill as a hoop, as a train runner, as music and whatever, a different way of running a business. What he was good at was picking his team around him. 
Um, and again, you know, when you think of other sorts of leaders, don't just think in terms of politics and money. You've got these thought leaders, you know, that actually knowledge, one of the things that's very clear is how do we mobilize knowledge, how do we mobilize thinking? So whether it's Freud, whether it's Keynes, whether it's Socrates. Again, trying to think through, when we think leadership, it's not just the Churchills, it's not the Napoleons, it's not the sports leaders. It, are, it is people, thought leaders. Um, and you know, most of them are, are men. Um, and the same sort of debates that sort of go on in women, you know, you know, you know I can't even pronounce the name anymore, but Batman Geller. Got it right? Who runs um, Kids Fund? You know, really interesting, very vibrant. Uh, one of the things that's striking about uh, Hillary Clinton is how, how she's aged. Actually, mm -hmm. it's really you know what she's been going through. And a lot of people would put Merkel as an extraordinary. I love that image of these two different sorts of leaders: the symbolic Lady Di bending down to that really tough symbolic, you know, like Mother Teresa. I think it's a wonderful contrast. Of two, you know, what is it about those people? And I think when you're thinking leadership, you can't just go through the literature. You do need to make your own personal judgments. And looking at some of these images is one way to do that. The sort of research I've done, um, in particular in South Asia, looking at the, some of these very big successful NGOs in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, one of the things that shines up is the sheer personal commitment of the individuals, the value real drive within them. They have an inquiring energy, they have a natural curiosity, they're willing to experiment, um, to adapt things. High levels of emotional intent, not just in terms of interpersonal skills, but a, a very clear awareness of their own weaknesses. You know, the self-awareness, absolutely crucial element of leadership within them. And this ability to um, balance different roles. So again, sort of different images when you think you can either have the, the leadership, you can go the formal research and you get lists like this. Um, you know, what is it that works for you? Really interesting, this new work, which is coming out, emphasis much more on teams. So if you look at Mike Hudson, Jakarta's Ashworth work on the charities in this country, when the huge emphasis on leadership teams. Um, and you know the importance of getting the right people in the leadership team. It's not about the leader; it's about the team. That's absolutely crucial within that, and that ability to remove um, SNT members um, absolutely crucial. So there's something about that. But I think one of the things that comes out from their work strongly is this thing about leaders modelling behaviour. Absolutely crucial. You know, so if you say there'd be a meeting, the leader doesn't turn up late. You don't expect them to be sitting there on their iPads or their iPhones. You know, that in other words, if they're expecting other people to behave in a certain way, they behave in that way. And that comes up very clearly from their work. It's well worth looking at. It came out last year. Um, but take, they took 500 uh, UK charities, and one of the things they, they started, what Mike did, was started with a focus on leadership. But very soon he realised that the focus had to be on leadership team. Um, and this thing by leadership, by behaviour, um, absolutely crucial. What are the, the drivers of outstanding teams? The way the teams work together, the working relationship. With the so it's worth looking at that. But I think what it means is that, again, you can go back to that sort of research, the sort of thing I did, which was looking very much at the individuals, or you say, no, actually, we're moving on. We're more sophisticated. We've got to look at the way people interact and they work with teams. And so when we're rethinking leadership, talk it in terms of teams um, and, and modeling behavior within them. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this was a matrix trying to get people to think about different competencies. But one of the things I would argue in light of this complex picture is that we need to be moving to a high performance leadership that is much more externally focused. And the danger with NGOs in the past, particularly NGOs in the South, that they're quite maternalistic or paternalistic, they're quite inward looking. Um, and often in this country, we've gone for fairly safe managerialist leaders. And I would argue, and I think a lot of people would argue, that actually for the, to cope with these new challenges, to cope with this new context, to cope with putting in place these new uh, capabilities, we need a much more catalytic leaders 
who can engage in strategy, can get engaged with boards to think strategically, um, and are outward facing, boundary scanning, rather than a much more traditional, say, pair of hands, which is often what's been happening within that. So it's just one typology amongst many. So, pulling this all together, what I think I'm arguing, and a lot of people would, and going back to that Bond report, we do need future fit leaders. We need to rethink leadership in terms of change and transformative leaders. You know, so it's not just about embracing change, but being able to manage change. I think it's a really important point. It's not, you, can, you get people who can embrace it and talk about it, but actually how you put it in place. Um, and how long does that engage? It's this idea of a shared responsibility. It's not about a one to get into, it is something about senior management teams, and it's certainly something that we need to recognize middle managers have a leadership role. People who are department heads, unit heads. Um, and I think the danger has been is that leadership has just been stuck at the top of the near. Whereas actually, if you're talking about smart working, if you're talking about new ways of working, new organization, very much middle managers. They're the ones who actually will put in place any change program. I did a big piece of work last year for every child. Every child, if you know, has just killed itself. They've committed suicide, they've closed down, they've given all their money away, they've sold their buildings. And it took the board and the senior management team about five or six years to get their heads around that to plan for it. Once they did that, they then announced it to the staff and said, what a great idea, isn't it wonderful? Explain why it was wonderful, let's get on with it. They couldn't quite understand why the staff didn't get it. They'd had five years thinking about it. And it's, again, it's the way we engage middle managers, junior staff. If you, I've worked with Gates and the Gates Foundation, they talk about the lost year. Um, again, they can put in place fantastic plans, brilliant plans, fantastic milestones. But invariably, in a lot of their programs, they lose a year. Why? Because it's the people who are doing it at the sharp end, the field managers, the operational managers. So again, I think we need to recognize that leadership is a shared responsibility, and it's not just about putting money into senior management teams. Clearly, it's you know, the competing demands. That's pretty self-evident, I think. Um, and so, People talk about the leadership deficit, where are we going to find this gen next generation, what are the characteristics, what are the competences that are needed, um, how do we develop that, there's very little research into this. Um, but I think you would find, if I was talking with people at London Business School, Judge Institute in Cambridge, Shire Business School, they'd be having much the same debates. How do we take leadership development forward? We're, we're certainly caught. In a, in a sort of model of, of you know, a bit of mentoring, a bit, bit of 360, a bit of sort of talk and show. And there's a real challenge out there um, in terms of the broader debates in terms of leadership development. So I know that you're talking in terms of legacy, you know, and that's, an, that's a different route into it, but it's just an example of, of what we're talking about. So I think, you know, the challenge for when we're rethinking is where is leadership? Is it throughout the organization, is it million people at the top? It's about leadership, which is leading change, um, and balancing these competing demands, and um, maintaining our values. I do really worry about this. You know, I come back to this, particularly in the nonprofit sector. There has to be something about maintaining values. Um, and I think that's true in all organizations. I mean, whether you're Coca-Cola or whether you're Diffid or whether you're the MOD or whatever it is, they do have values. And actually, the military are brilliant about reinforcing values. I mean, that's one of their real strengths. Um, they may not like their values, but they are really good at you know, seeing themselves as value-driven organizations. So I think there's some really interesting issues within the so I suppose what I would leave it with you, the world out there is changing. It's, we've always talked about change. It, it seems there's more, there's a deeper concern. It, it seems more imminent at the moment. Um, you know, these bond reports, the, the work that different NGOs are doing, the work that Market Commission are doing, they're, they're, they're something, something slightly deeper. So there, there's change in the air. What do organizations look like in 2025? smart working, disintermediation, brokers, what is it that a northern organization looks like working in the south? Um, 
And therefore, who's going to lead that forward? Is it an individual leader? Is it a team of people? And if it's a team of people, where? Is it more middle managers? Is it, you know, that's the bit I don't know. And that's why I think we do need to rethink this. You know, what are these attributes? What is it we're trying to develop? You know, there are no easy answers, and maybe actually the sort of tried and true is perfectly good. But do they need special support? Do they need special investment in development? Is it the leadership teams that need or is it the middle managers that need that? And then we come back to the whole broader discussion around investment in management, development, core cost, training budgets, and the things that always get hit first, etc. etc. Um, and I do think there may be some interesting issues about recruitment and selection and how, who it is that we're selecting. Uh, and that raises issues for boards, particularly the non-profits, because they, at the end of the day, should be doing the recruitment. I mean, that, that, that's one of their primary roles, is the, is the, is the recruitment and the uh, appraisal of a chief executive. So there's some real issues backing into governance and link to that, you know, to what extent the board's have a leadership role. And then similarly, what are the implications and stuff. So that's been my voyage. It took a little bit longer than I expected. Um, I hope you've followed the logic. I hope you've stayed awake. If anyone has any major concerns, queries, even criticism, please raise them now. Um, but I hope you've followed, followed the thread. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you.